So we're going to take a very brief look at financial instruments. As we know, this is a very broad topic, but let's So we get our key, key definitions. A financial instrument is a contract that creates a financial asset for one party. A finan and a financial liability or equity for another. And the other thing which I think it's useful to know is a derivative. And with a derivative, it has three key elements. First of all, it's got no or a very low cost compared to the value of the transaction. Secondly, its value varies due to changes in value of something else. Now that something else could be an interest rate, it could be a currency price, it could be a commodity price, it's something of that nature. and it's settled it's settled at a future date so whenever you're looking at something and you think it might be a derivative go through the three elements to see whether we've satisfied all three items Next. Do we have an equity or a liability? This is important for gearing purposes. So the standard's actually quite strict. If a company or a business has an obligation, now think of an obligation as a commitment, it must pay out. So if a company has an obligation to make specified payments on specified dates we treat the financial instrument as a liability
e.g. a seven percent preference share that pays dividends on the first of the second first of February each year and if you don't pay the dividend because you can't afford to then you have to pay it the following year so if it's a cumulative preference dividend that would be a liability if we've got convertible preference shares where the holder of the share or convertible let's say yeah convertible preference preference shares where the holder of the share can insist on repayment again that would be a liability because you'd have to make a specified payment on a specified date if we take a look at the issue of complex instruments these have an element of both liability and equity we always calculate the liability element first by discounting at the rate on a non convertible bond because we're nearly always in these scenarios we're looking at convertible debentures and one of the advantages of holding a convertible debenture is that what are you converting into you converting into shares now if the share price goes up you're going to take the share option so therefore can you see that there's a potential benefit and as a consequence to that you're prepared to accept a lower rate of interest because you've got a potential capital gain if the share price goes up if the share price goes down you convert into cash sorry you don't convert to cash you you take that you take the cash quick example X issues a thirty million dollar four percent convertible bond conversion is in three years. the rate on similar non-convertible bonds is 
So what do we do? Well, step one, I'm going to calculate the liability value. So it's a three-year bond. How much interest is payable? The nominal value of the bond is 30 million at 4%. So by working out the present value of the cash flows, and I'm going to discount those at 12%. So in year one, our cash flow is 30 million at 4%, so that's 1.2 million. I discount that at 12%. That gives us a figure of 1071. In year two, exactly the same except we're going to discount that for two years. So that gives us a figure of 957. And in year three, you always assume that we've got a full repayment. So that would be 31.2 million. So we assume that you repay the whole of the capital of 30 million plus the interest of 1.2. And here we've got a figure of 22208. Add those up. Two, four, two, three, seven. So the liability element, we've received thirty million dollars, and we're going to allocate of that thirty million dollars, we're going to allocate twenty four point two three seven to liabilities. So step two, we work out our equity and simply just work your way through the journal. Debit cash. 30 million. Credit liability 24237 and credit equity with the balance which works out as 5763. And you would credit that to other reserves. It wouldn't go to retained earnings. Step three, we calculate interest and the liability using the amortized cost model. So the amortized cost model is the one where we use a table. Date first of the first of year one. What have we done? We have borrowed two, four, two, three, seven. Now our statement of profit and loss interest is always calculated using the yield on the non-convertible bonds. So therefore our interest charge in the statement of profit and loss will be worked out at 12%. That gives a figure of 2908. In terms of the cash, well we said we worked out earlier that the annual interest being physically paid was only 1200. So that's going to deduct the sum due. So we can work out our liability as effectively as the difference being added. Two, 
2, 5, 9, 4, 5. Yeah, 2. 2, 5, 9, 4, 5. Times 0 0.12 is 3, 1, 1, 4. Three one one three This takes us up at the end of year two to two seven eight five eight. And in an exam you'd only have to do this for one year in all probability. Two years at the most. This is just really to give us confidence that what we're doing is technically correct. Three three four two less 1200 and that takes us to 30 million and then we will debit liability 30 million and we will credit either cash or share capital and premium. And that will be depending on whether or not the other party asks for their money back or they ask for shares. So just go from the instructions that you'll see in the question. So those are complex instruments. The next thing we need to consider is how do we go about measuring financial instruments. And if we focus on financial assets, if we buy equities, we measure them at fair value. through profit and loss unless we elect at acquisition to hold them at fair value through OCI. And this is for non-trading equities only. Now by non-trading what I mean is that we've bought them with the intention of holding them on, on a long-term basis. So trading means buying and selling. So if we've bought a strategic 10% in a company because we want to get a supply chain benefit or things of that nature, or we want to have a little bit of influence over that company, you can say, well, the intention is to hold long term. We're not interested in short term gains and losses going through profit and loss, and therefore such movements we will take through other comprehensive income. This is issues for things such as earnings per share, because it's going to not hit earnings per share, is it? If the assets that we've bought are bonds,
we apply two tests. One, are we entitled to receive cash flows on specific dates? And secondly, is it the intention to collect those cash flows? We call this the business model test. So we have a cash collection test and we have a business model test. And if you think about it, well, there's two reasons why we might have bought bonds. We might have bought them because we think that they are undervalued in the market. It could be that we bought some junk bonds from a company and we're, we believe that the market's got the analysis of that company wrong and those bonds are therefore too cheap and therefore we think we can sell them at a later date. So here, the intention of buying them was to trade rather than to collect the cash flows. So therefore we would have failed that particular test. If we have a yes to both tests, use the amortized cost model. If a no, to at least one test, use fair value through profit and loss. Transaction costs for fair value through profit and loss are expensed to the statement of profit and loss. Transaction costs for amortized cost items are deducted from the bond in the SFP. Next we come to the issue of an impairment. What happens if we have a financial asset and for whatever reason we believe its value has decreased? So if the carrying amount of a financial asset is greater than the recoverable amount, write it down to the recoverable amount. Now you'll do this automatically, won't you, if you're valuing at fair value? because you fair value becomes your recoverable amount at the year end. So here we're really looking at debts owed to the company which we're valuing using the amortized cost method. 
we use the interest rate in existence. when the bond was first acquired. Example On the first of the first X5 A incorporated bought a 10 million 4% bond in B at par Repayment was due on the first of the first X6. On the 31st of December X5, B advised it could not repay the bond. It offered to pay four million on the thirty first of the twelfth X six and six million on the thirty first of the twelfth X seven. The interest rate on bonds of a similar risk to be at the 31st of December X5 was 15%. To our solution, the present value of the cash flows at the 31st of the 12th X5, what's that going to be? It's going to be 4 million, but we continue to discount it at the original rate of interest, plus 6 million. Discount it twice. So that's nine point three nine million, and therefore we would debit the statement of profit and loss zero point six one million and we would credit our financial asset. Not point six one million. Okay. Finally, we've got hedging.
we can only hedge if once again there's three things that we focus on first of all the hedge is designated in relation to an existing asset or a highly probable transaction. So it's got to be designated. Secondly, it is highly effective. And by highly effective, what we mean is the hedge item, which is our asset or highly probable transaction, divided by the hedge instrument. And the hedge instrument will always be a derivative. So therefore it will be a forward contract for currency or an interest rate swap or an option or something of that nature. Is in the range 80% to 125 percent. And thirdly, it has to be measurable. There are two types of hedge. There's a fair value hedge and then we've got a cash flow hedge and a cash flow hedge only applies to a highly probable future transaction. So for example, I could be British Airways and I want to buy three aircraft from Boeing, but Boeing are going to sell them to me in dollars and I'm a UK company and I'm going to therefore have a potential exchange gain or loss. So can you see that our, we've got a highly probable cash flow risk which is going to be losing money on currency. With a fair value hedge the gain and the loss on both the hedge item and the instrument are taken to the statement of profit and loss. So with a fair value hedge you can actually revalue inventories upwards if for example we're measuring them in a different currency which is something you wouldn't normally do. With a cash flow hedge the effective part is taken to OCI the ineffective part is taken to the statement of profit and loss. So those are the main issues in relation to financial instruments.
what are they, how do we measure them, how do we classify them, what happens when the value goes down, what happens in terms of hedges.